Point number three, ensure adequate nutrition, vitamins, trace elements, and never overfeed. Now this is in reference to, of course, your fish and your corals. So at the end of the day, the corals are going to be using the light, they're going to be um, using the water flow, they're going to be pulling nutrients out of the water, they're going to be pulling various trace elements out of the water, and how well the coral will grow will be generally governed by its most minimal <coughs> factor, not its most abundant factor. So you can have the best lights in the world, but your corals still don't last. Or you can have the best water flow in the world, and your corals necessarily still don't last. Because it's the thing that's missing that usually causes the most problem. So ensuring that you've got adequate nutrition and vitamins and trace elements for your corals is quite important. And also remember that the outcome of these subtleties take time. So let's say that you don't have enough iodine in your water. Your corals are fine, your corals are fine, your corals are fine, your corals are fine. But then down the track, one of them might experience a bit of an um, infection due to maybe getting stung by another coral or maybe getting harassed by a fish or something like that. And then that coral could easily die basically due to the fact that it didn't have enough iodine to defend it. Because iodine is an element which helps the immune system of the coral. And, and iodine is not an element that the corals suck up and keep. Basically the iodine is just used as the coral needs it. So the outcome is long. So it's basically exactly the same as say a guy that, goes to, that finds out from his doctor that he's got high cholesterol and he says, I'm alright. Of course he's alright. He's okay today, he's okay next month, he's okay next year, but then down the track there's a cost to the fact that he's got high cholesterol. Because what I'm getting at is that if it's not quite right, then it's not quite right. So whether it be your health or the health of your corals, it's exactly the same. So there are various trace elements and nutrients that the corals require, and some more than other corals. Like we know that you put in various types of corals, whether it be your corellas, your leather corals, and for, they don't seem to be that bothered by the amount of trace elements that you add. Whereas other corals, such as goniopores, alveoporas, and other types of corals, seem to be very dependent on the amount of trace elements that you have. And it all, it's all relevant to a long period of time. Because what I want to propose to you is that your corals are either growing or they're dying. So, you know, when someone comes to me and says, oh, that was pretty good. That coral lasts for nine months. It lived for nine months. Is the bad news that I want to suggest is the coral didn't actually live for nine months. The coral took nine months to die. Because the corals should be outliving you. Corals live for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the only reason why your corals will not live for hundreds and hundreds of years is if you're not offering the coral what it needs. So if you're not meeting its basic minimum requirements. Right, so basically what I'm getting at is if your corals are not growing, they're dying. And what I want to suggest to you is that there's only two <coughs> reasons why your corals will die. So your corals will only not thrive for two reasons. One is the coral has too much of something. Or two, the coral has not enough of something. So that's what I want you to look at. So basically you look at your coral, and if you haven't noticed some sort of growth over time, you can bet you it's dying. And that's why photographs are wonderful, wonderful. Everyone's got digital cameras now. Honestly, one of the best things you can do, take a picture of your photo, of your aquarium, upload it on Facebook for God's sake. Then you can see the corals, and if you don't notice over time some sort of growth in that coral, I want you to suggest that something's not right. Because I want to suggest to you that if the coral's not growing, it's dying. And I want to suggest that it simply is not growing, or it's not thriving, because there's too much of something or not enough of something, and that's it, that's all that's involved. So does it have too much light? Does it have not enough light? Does it have too much water flow? Does it have not enough water flow? Does it have too much nutrients? Does it have not enough nutrients? Does it have too much trace elements? Does it have not enough trace elements? That's all it is. 
all it is. It's just basically a balance. And remembering that each coral is probably going to have a different circumstance within your own fish tank. And you can basically sometimes swap corals around and alter their circumstance. So what are the things that are affecting your corals? <coughs> is it it's getting stung by a coral next to it? Do you need to go in at night time and check for sweeper tentacles? Is the coral being harassed by a fish? Therefore it's not getting enough light. Is your coral getting attacked by some sort of little pests? Therefore it's not opening up and it's not getting enough light or it's not getting enough nutrients because it's trying to fight off these little bugs. Is it, is it lacking a various trace element? Does it require um, more magnesium or whatever it is? So what, I, what I'm inviting you to look at is that when your corals are not going the way you want it, I just want you to look carefully and consider what is it too much of or is there not enough of. So what thoughts have we got on that, guys? Can I ask a question? Yep. If you've got coral that, as you say, hasn't been doing anything for several months and you think, okay, it's dying, is it too late to, to make it live again? Usually Probably not. not Okay, if we, if we have a coral, and the coral is starting to recede, then um, if it's got an infection and you haven't been able to um, deal with the infection, maybe it's too late, but a lot of the time it's not. Because I've actually been involved in aquariums where all the corals are just not doing too well. And then we found out what's missing, what's that minimum requirement that is not being met, and then all of a sudden the corals will regrow. Because you'll see all the time, especially when you take a piece home, you'll see a piece that maybe it's a cataphilia, for example, and it's in a shell this big, and the coral itself is that big, and the, and the actual coral has regrown from the position that, where it was dying off. So a lot of corals, and especially with things like goniopora, you see that these things looks like a round, should look like a round golf ball, because some of them look like round golf balls that go like that. And some of them look like a golf ball and it's got a chunk there and the coral comes off here. That just means that for whatever reason it's, it's either been knocked over and it's been shaded or it's been attacked by a coral next to it and it's caused it to grow this way. So corals can definitely recover. So once again, I want you looking, if you've got a coral that's not going well, I want you just looking at each one of these points and playing with each one of these points and giving a three week lag for each one of these points. So remember that whatever we do today, we don't go looking for a result tomorrow. So generally you're looking at a three week lag. We look to see if we get any improvements. Yep. Why do some corals attack other corals and why do fish bother corals? Okay. Because in, once again, in the wild, corals are a, a, a valuable food source to some fish. So corals will actually, some fish will actually eat the corals. And then in aquariums, sometimes, like I mean, in, in behaviourally, why do they attack corals? Well, either because they do in the wild, or sometimes, sometimes I swear they do it because they're bored. I mean, um, whatever the reason, um, if you do have a fish that's attacking your corals, you've got two choices. Don't buy the coral that the fish is attacking. Because you'll find that, for example, if you have an angel, it might go for cataphilias and um, scenarios, but it won't touch most of the other corals. So you do need to make a decision. If you have got a coral that the fish is nipping at the coral, you need to make a decision whether you're not going to keep that coral anymore or whether you're going to get rid of the fish. So, I mean, that's just something that happens. And so there's nothing wrong with the fact that they do that because that's what they do. What other questions have we got, guys? Yeah? So, you're saying about that either have enough or they don't have enough. You, the list could be a mile long. Like yeah. when, you think of, when you go through all the trace elements and you go through all, a, a, everything else, like temperature and obviously water flow and lights and stuff like that. Yeah. You're saying just change one of those things every three weeks. It could take you a long time to get to that the That depends result. on how far off the mark you think you're on in the first place. Because, mm. I mean, if your temperature is already right, that should be a given. If your water flow is already right, well then, that should be a given. Um, not, not to mention pH and all the rest, and then should be right. But then you just, well, you get to know your aquarium. If, if, you're, if your aquarium is in a dire straits, then it is going to be a fairly long list. But if you actually sit down and write down them all, it's actually not that bad. So, I mean, most of them you don't even need to be concerned about. Because most of your trace elements and so forth, it comes down to are you adding a trace element supplement or not? Because most of your trace element supplements are really quite good. I mean, some of them are very advanced, and um, providing that you are adding a trace element supplement, you're totally fine. 
something else we should really talk about too is trace elements and skimmers. Because um, for some sorts of coral, I'll just quickly go into that. Now for some sorts of corals, such as Acroboras, it seems that high skimming is highly beneficial. Though to a lot of other corals, um, unless you're adding um, trace elements quite um, regularly, you just need to consider that tra the protein skimmer is actually pulling a lot of them out. So my main advice in regards to, tra to trace elements, let's say taking aquaporas out of it, because um, a lot of people find that they do need skimmers for, for, um, for aquaporas, although that's not 100% true, I'll talk about that in a minute, is you do a three-week test with your, with your skimmer. Now, the way you do a three-week test with your skimmer is you turn the skimmer on and you don't do any water changes or don't add any trace elements for three weeks. If at the end of the three weeks, I don't, everyone knows what a protein skimmer is? Anyone not know? Um, at the end of the three weeks, if the skimmer is still skimming and it's still pulling out lots of nasty looking stuff, I want to suggest that that skimmer is excellent. It's a very good idea to beat it. But I want to say to you that almost never, I mean almost never, does someone try a three week test and then find at the end of the three weeks, you're still cleaning your skimmer, you're still making sure your skimmer's running effectively, but at the end of three weeks you haven't added in trace elements, you haven't altered your feeding pattern, and you have not done any water changes, you find after one to two weeks your skimmer's doing nothing. It's not pulling out any. Then you go and you buy your trace elements, you put them back in the water again because you bought them because you want them in there, and your skimmer's skimming like crazy. And so often someone says to me, oh, my skimmer's amazing. My skimmer pulls out so much stuff. But you've got to think, what is it pulling out? In most circumstances, the skimmer is pulling out your trace elements. Because once upon a time, a protein skimmer was an absolutely crucial and important part of a reef aquarium. Because what was our filter medium back then? Bioballs. Now, what does a bioball do? A bioball breaks high-level waste into low-level waste which is effectively something you don't want into something else that you don't want. It's all um, oxidization, it's all nitrification. So skimmers were wonderful because you put a skimmer in, your skimmer sucks out a lot of the high level organics before they convert to low level organics. But with our new systems, we have very balanced bacterial allocation. Now bacterial allocation means that you feed your fish, your fish eat the food, your fish assimilate the nutrients in the food and produce waste, let's say in the form of ammonia. Then microorganisms are going to eat the crap from the fish and assimilate that waste into their own um, structures. Then bacteria is going to break down your ammonia into nitrites, not to mention all the microalgae and so forth that will also be assimilating your ammonia. Then your nitrites are breaking down into nitrates, then your nitrates are getting broken down into nitrogen gas in any sort of anaerobic zone. So that means within your live rock, that means within the depth of your sand, or even more beneficial than that, in um, something like a refrigerant. <coughs> now there's a new medium, actually, hey Luke, where are you? Can you run up and quickly grab me a um, refrigerant block out of the um, refrigerant filter? Now, th there's a brand new filter material, which um, besides one order, is not quite available in Australia yet. Um, I've had uh, one large order come through. Has anyone here got um, refresh yet? Yep. So, how are you finding it? Excellent. And what's your feedback? Like, tell us a bit more. How's your nitrate levels and all that? Yeah, been fine there. Yep. Stage and stage. how was it before you got it? Yeah, I had a bit trouble. Yep, yep. Well, basically, this new medium, it's, it's an American product. It, the technology is not actually new. It's only new in Australia. Um, is the thick one there? Yeah, you got that one. Yeah, you got thick one. Okay, now, so basically, this is called cell pore technology. It's brand new. It, it will be available again, hopefully, in about eight weeks um, when the new shipment arrives. But basically, it's a big, look like a foam block. Now, through this foam block is all these tiny pores which all open onto each other. So like a bubble 
that opens onto a bubble, so it creates all these tiny rooms. Think of this like the massive city. And then inside this massive city grows all these microorganisms and bacteria. So because all of the, the rooms are connected within this city, a microorganism, be it an amphipod, a copepod, a little worm, or whatever, can actually walk from one side through the corridors and rooms and everything and come out the other side. And each one of these little rooms fill up with bacteria colonies and microorganisms. And it's absolutely wonderful medium for what's called bacterial allocation. So bacterial allocation means you've got your high level nutrients such as your ammonia, which actually diffuse into this medium. Then due to a specific poricity, it allows a certain amount of oxygen into it, which allows the middle of this medium to go anaerobic. Anaerobic means that it's not using free oxygen molecules. It's using nitrate. Now what's nitrate? N O3, which means that nitrate contains one molecule of nitrogen and three molecules of oxygen. So therefore the organisms that grow inside this block in the middle of the city are actually using your nitrate as their respiration. So they're releasing nitrogen gas, which has no odour, is totally harmless, and will precipitate out of your aquarium again. Now where the risk is, which is not possible with this, because this will only allow a certain amount of oxygen into it, if you have very fine sand at the bottom of your aquarium, the top goes nitrifying, so therefore your ammonia breaks into nitrate, then you've got a thin layer which would be anaerobic, which is, your, um, which is going to break down your nitrate, but then as soon as there's no oxygen molecules left at all from your um, nitrate, it goes to another state which is called anoxic. And anoxic is where you have a, anoxic bacteria which actually feed on sulfides, which are well and truly present in the aquarium, and can, sorry, sulfates, which can um, convert them to sulfides which bond with hydrogen from the water and create hydrogen sulfide, which is actually quite poisonous. So there's actually been cases where someone's got a very deep layer of very fine sand, and then they go to rearrange your aquarium a little bit, and they release these sinks of hydrogen sulfide into the water, which actually just kills all their fish. So that's why we always recommend a low, thin level of um, say so one mil coral sand, that way um, the one mil coral sand is not going to be as risky, particularly in a thin layer, so the chance of anaerobics, of anoxics building up is very low. Now, who of you guys, has, has anyone not seen my DVDs yet? Well, anyone that doesn't have one of the DVDs, I want to really, really suggest you grab one on the way out. Because the D tonight I'm going to be talking all about the principles of aquarium care, but the DVDs really go into the detail. So um, it's a double pack DVD and it goes right into the biology, the chemistry and all the stuff that I'm talking about tonight, but in a much more beautiful way to watch it. <coughs> and all these sorts of, it'll address all these recommendations that I'm saying again. So um, what I meant by bacterial allocation is that you have fish waste, which is broken down by bacteria, which are broken down by other bacteria, which are producing nitrogen gas. So therefore we don't have nitrate. So therefore, once upon a time when we had the protein skimmers being a um, be-all and end-all thing, we were running biological film materials that produce nitrate. Does that make sense? Alright, so what other questions we got on that before we move on? So where would you put that on the drop line? It either goes in the back of your aquarium. Yep. If you have something like a Red Sea Max, you just drop that in the back. Then you build your corals around it and you won't even know it's there. Because it's the same colour as coral sand, your coral sand's down here. You can use that as a bit of a shelf, you build your rocks around it, you'll learn, never even know it's there. And you leave it there forever. <laughs> yeah, leave it there forever. Leave it there. Now, in regard, that one's not for sale, because that's in the filter upstairs. But anyone that wants one of these, um, just come and see us and we'll place an order for you and we will ensure that you get one. But it might be about eight weeks wait. But it's, they're really, really worth it. You, uh, and you've got to ask anyone that's got one. You're running nitrate levels at pretty much zero. 
Can They're you very, very good. Can you place them in your sump? Perfect. The sump is the best place for them, um, but they also work in the back of the aquarium. They don't need water force through them, of course, because it's a passive absorption. It's actually sucking the nutrients out of the water. Any other questions on that before we move on? So it's going to be called Revolution. It's getting branded Revolution. Um, that's the prototype ones, which is called Refresh. All right, so I'm going to move on from that. Just one more question. Yep. So would you use it over macroalgae? It's totally different. It's going to kill macroalgae. Now, macroalgae is going to slowly suck and store nutrients out of the water. Then when you take out the macroalgae, you're going to pull out those nutrients. Now, it, it's, the capacity of this <coughs> way, 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 way surpasses it. So, and you can run them together. Like, let's say you've got a refrigium. Refrigium, mind you, just means safe place. And so it's usually a separate tank connected to your main tank, which you might have, say, a revolution block, and then you might have some macroalgae growing on the top of it if you wanted to, no problem. But people use algae for filtration by putting a separate little um, aquarium with a light, and if you are going to use macroalgae as filtration, it's really important to have plenty of iron in the water. Because otherwise the algae grows, the algae grows, the algae grows, the algae grows, and then it all just dies off again. And the main reason why they die off tends to be not enough iron in the water. So make sure you're using an iron supplement. But the, so as I said before, the, the, um, the macroalgae is just storing it. The, the macroalgae doesn't actually use that much, doesn't actually assimilate all that much nitrate or phosphate at all. <coughs> but it does store a fair bit. So microalgae is way better. So all your microalgae that just grow naturally in the aquarium, they're, because their their lifestyle is, I mean, they grow much faster. Um, they're really using a lot. They're assimilating a lot more. Does that make sense? Right. Let's keep moving, guys. So we've said ensure adequate light. We know about that. Ensure adequate water flow. Um, ensure Adequate nutrition, vitamins, trace elements never overfeed. Now I'll just do a quick thing on feeding. Feeding is quite simple. First of all, quality is everything. The quality of the food you feed makes an absolutely massive impact on the health of your fish. Now you can feed a variety of good quality foods, that's good. I want to encourage that. But the best food by far is, in my biased opinion, is definitely spectrum. Now, who uses Spectrum here? Well, a lot of us, anyone that has not tried Spectrum, go and try it. It produces almost no organic waste. It's a very, very clean food. And what I mean by that is that fish absorb, let's say, this much protein, this much vitamin A, this much vitamin B, this much calcium, this much whatever, like an actual um, um, breaker. Then, whatever they don't use, they pass. <coughs> and what's amazing is that the amount of the ratio of nutrients of a predator or the amount of nutrients of a herbivore is pretty much the same. It's how they process the food that really makes a difference. So you can actually feed spectrum to a lionfish, and you can feed spectrum to a clownfish, and you can feed spectrum to a tank, because it's pretty much set at the absorption rate of the fish and you find they don't produce a lot of waste. On the other hand, if you feed bloodworms, if you feed live fish, if you feed very high protein foods, the fish actually eat the food, they take whatever protein they need, which is probably not much because they're getting so much of it every day anyway, so they're sucking for vitamins out of the food, and then they pass the rest out as waste. Then your herbivores, which actually, because a predator has a big stomach and a small digestive system, and it's able to digest very high protein, easily digestible foods, and large, large amounts of it. Something like a tang or a herbivorous fish, it doesn't really have a dedicated stomach. It has a very long intestine. So therefore, your hard to digest foods, or your green stuffs, uh, have a very long time to actually get digested. And if you feed these fish too much high protein foods, they often suffer from bloat and other problems. But basically, they're trying to break down the food and spend a lot of time breaking down the food to extract any protein or any stuff that might not be present for them. And the rest comes out as waste. But you can feed both of these fish a food which is tailored to the nutrient absorption of fish in general, meaning a high quality food, and actually get exactly the same results 
over very, very prolonged periods of time, like 10 years or whatever, or more, with awesome results just by feeding high quality foods. So, so variety is great, but it does not substitute for quality. Now the next thing is how much to feed. So basically there's a guideline that I'm just going to throw out there. For most average reef aquariums, try and feed about what the fish eat in 30 seconds. So that means you put a bit of food in, you let the fish eat all the food, and you try and make sure there's not one dot of food left after 30 seconds. Now remember that's a guide, and every aquarium is actually slightly different. Some fish, for example, like Antheus, they're not going to survive with a diet like that. Antheus need to feed more regularly. So as a, I'm talking about a guide. As a guide, to feed five times a week, what the fish eat in 30 seconds, and you watch your fish. It's your fish that actually tell you. Over time, let's say once again, over a three week lag, if we see the fish losing weight, they're getting a little bit thinner, then we need to increase our food a little bit. Just a little bit. <coughs> on the other hand, over three weeks, if we notice them putting on a bit of weight, then we want to decrease our food a little bit. So remembering that your fish are not supposed to have whopping big stomachs, and they're also not supposed to be skinny. So the best thing to do is just, you know, get as familiar as you can with the species you've got, and look at the weight they're supposed to have. But at the end of the day, you don't want them too fat, you don't want them too thin, you want them just, just right. So I offer you a guide, but really I want to suggest that the fish are the main thing that tell you how much food they need. And don't worry if one fish eats all the food, because if one fish goes up and eats all the food, that just means he's probably going to crap out more, and then the crap that he actually produces, well, the other fish will then eat that. It's a nice shot. So what other feeding questions have we got, guys? So remember, once again, everything's about balance. It's all about too much, food, not enough food, um, or foods with enough nutrients, or not enough nutrients, too much protein, not enough protein, it's, everything's about balance. So basically, once again, the fish are really going to tell you what they need as long as you're acute enough to actually notice. They're not getting too thin, they're not getting too fat. And once again, if I can recommend anything, try Spectrum Food. I'm very, very biased toward it. Um, I've been using it now for around maybe up to 15 years, and I've never found a food that um, that equals it. And I've never met anyone that uses Spectrum that then goes to try something else and says it's better. It's just never happened. So, um, anyone um, kept, anyone you, you use Spectrum and disagree with that? No, it never, never happens. So anyway, give Spectrum a go. If you don't have it, go and get it. It's worth it. So, high quality foods, well, high quality foods are going to make sure that you're getting the right vitamins and nutrients, and then high quality supplements for your corals. So anytime you want, I'll sit with you personally, and I'll show you that there's some supplements, this is what I do, I go to the first supplement and I say, this one is a good idea, you don't really have to have it. This one, definitely, 100% get it. This one here, it's a good idea, but you don't really need to have it. So. I'll show you what are the supplements that most people have and have a beautiful thriving aquarium, whereas there are other ones that seem like a good idea but in the masses don't seem to be so important. But I'll do that personally with anyone that wants to, just to go over what supplements or trace elements you should have. So everyone cool with that? Yeah. Should you be putting the supplements and trace elements in only once a week or twice a week, allowing for the skimmer? You know, taking it out of the water. Okay, what most people do in regards to the skimmer, the most popular thing for a skimmer is that people will take the cap off the skimmer, they'll add their trace elements Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for example, then they might have, say, Thursday, if not Thursday, Friday as a rest, and then they'll put their skimmer on again, put the cap on again for, say, um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or whatever. So most people create a routine around the skimmer and when they add the trace elements. Because obviously, if you want to run a skimmer, it makes sense to actually put the trace elements in and then give the corals time to use those trace elements. Because remember, the corals don't store and hold the trace elements. It's not like protein or something like that where the fish will actually store it and use it later. They use it now or they don't use it. And once again, so therefore, you play around with, you, with that idea. 
So trace elements at the start of the week, skim at the end of the week. Something like that would make sense. And I'm more than happy to talk to you later to personally figure that out. Yep. So you're saying that for the, um, say like iodine, um, calcium, um, um, are you saying to pour it into the top of the skimmer or just pour it in the water? No, you pour, okay, I'll make this clear, you pour the you supplements it. into the actual aquarium. Yep. Any powders you must dissolve Dolly, yep. and you must make sure no powder gets into the aquarium. Must be just the liquid, in it goes. And then you take the cap off the skimmer and just let the trace elements have a few days. I see, yep. Then once the trace, because remember most of these trace elements don't stay in solution for long anyway. Most of these elements are going to be there for three days tops. So they go in there, they're going to either get used or disappear or get used by something else. So, and then you put your skimmer back on again. Hey, Lugi, can you bring me up some Easy Life? Now, there's other products which are really worth considering that help to keep the trace elements in the solution. Say, so, like, in general, let's consider that most trace elements stay in solution for three days, like whether that's scientific or not, let's not worry about. But most of these trace elements do not stay in solution for all that long. But there are products such as this one, which is called Easy Life, and it helps to hold it, it affects the molecular structure and it does a whole lot of stuff that I'm not even going to pretend we understand. But what it does do is hold in solution all the things that should be in solution and it helps to precipitate out of solution everything that shouldn't be in the solution. <coughs> now who's used this? Yeah, so what do we think? It's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, it's r this, this is the stuff you sell to someone with a perfect aquarium. And I'll give you a real life example. Um, a very close friend of mine, Peter Halloran, he has the perfect aquarium. Like, I mean, we're talking 30 grand, 40 grand. Just, it's amazing. It's massive. And you're looking at it, it's crystal clear, it's so beautiful. And I was just, oh man, you've got to get this stuff. And he's like, why? Like, why, why would I get this? My tank's going absolutely perfect. Corals are good, water's clear, everything's good. I say, all right, just here you go, just give it to him. Because I know he's going to buy 50 of them anyway. So I give him it. And he goes, and he, sure enough, he goes home. He tips the whole lot in. And it makes all your water cloudy. And that's while it's working. Then when it clear, when the water clears, the water is crystal clear. It's like there's not even, and you see the guys that have got it nodding, yeah. is that it's like there's not even any water in the fish tank. And then his tank is about 10 foot long, and I stood at the end of the fish tank, and I could see the fish at the other end of that 10 foot tank, as if there was not one drop of water in it. And the previous few days when I was at his house, it would look clear, it would look quite good, but certainly the fish down the other end were nowhere near as it as defined as the fish at this end. So um, this does a whole lot of stuff that we really don't understand. It is not expensive, so it is really worth trying. It'll make your water very clear. And the next day, Peter Howard's corals were opened out like you've never seen. Because, <coughs> yeah? How do you go if you put that email and shop in your corals and you can clean up your water that much? I don't think it's the penetrations. Um, okay, I really don't think you'd have a problem. Let's say that your water was really, really yellow, meaning it had a lot of gilding tint in it, and then you used this and it made it crystal clear, then you know maybe that's not such a good idea. But assuming your aquarium is quite, and I've never heard of a problem like you, then assuming your aquarium is relatively clear in the first place, I've definitely never, ever heard of a problem. It's a valid concern, but I don't think I've ever heard of it. So what other questions have I got? Um, can you say, take the cap off the skimmer? Yep. Just the cap. Just the, the, the skimmer cup? Or the Just the cup. Just so it doesn't collect anything. Because you leave it on, you leave it still frothing away. Unless it's an external skimmer, you might want to just turn the air off. Um, um, but just, just disengage it, so it's not going to work. So most skimmers are in people's sumps, so you just pull the whole cap off. Just let it do what it's doing, no problem. Otherwise, just put a pop on the end of the air, so then it's just still running, but it's not... Um, so it's just sort of like, yeah, that yeah it's still flying away, but it's not actually flaking. Yeah. There's no bubbles in it. Any more questions before we move on, guys?